decision to die. To surrender everything to him. And so Jesus turns to the crowd and he turns to you to me. And he asks the one question that will ultimately define our life. Are you a fan or a follower? Make a note. Uh, we got to do something different with the kids, man. Because <laughs> this side empties out, and the building starts to tilt. <laughs> but you know what? Isn't it wonderful? Isn't it wonderful? Isn't it wonderful to have almost as many kids as we do in the app as adults in the church? I, I mean, to me, that's just amazing, and I, I thank Forbes so much. Because as their ministry grows, you can look around and see the ministry of the Odyssey Church grows as well. And as, as Tara said, we are. Uh, really becoming a very close-knit family, and I want to appreciate that. I want to tell you how much I appreciate that. But, you know, I, I'm so glad you're here with us on Mother's Day. Uh, a couple years ago, uh, you know, I was uh, I was thinking about how I'd really been neglecting my wife in particular, but my whole family. I was working too hard. I was doing too much. And, and I decided I, I wanted to do something different. So it was Mother's Day, and uh, I go to the store, and I buy, you know, a whole bunch of chocolates, because, you know, women be loving chocolates. <laughs> if you will love them, you bring them chocolates, right? So I uh, I got one of them really mushy sweet cards that uh, almost drip with honey. I, I got a whole bouquet of, of roses, her favorite roses, yellow roses, so I got that. And I want to surprise her, so you know, I sort of walk up to the door. I'm not going to go right in. I'm really door, but I let her answer the door. And, all, and as, she, as she answers the door, I start singing, Have I told you lately that I love you? And she just, she just breaks down, crying and crying. And I'm like, honey, what's wrong? She goes, it's been a terrible day. It's been a terrible day. The sink's been stopped up. The toilet's overflowed. The kids have been terrible. It's been a house. It's been a wreck. And this just tops it all off. You come home drunk. <laughs> Not a true story. Not a true story. <laughs> but if you knew me 20 years ago, you know that that might have been. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Anyway, I want to I tell you, I really appreciate Eric coming over the history about Mother's Day this morning. Uh, many of you may not realize this, but Mother's Day is the third most celebrated holiday in the United States. It comes right after Christmas and right after Easter. Uh, over 145 million cards will be purchased for Mother's Day. Uh, there's about $14.6 billion built on Mother's Day. Um, I'm <coughs> My mom ain't getting all that, but I'm telling you, that's a ton of money, isn't it? $14.6 billion, 69% of all that money is spent on just flowers. So it's, it's really amazing when you think about it. And I don't know how they measure this, because who, who has long distance anymore? We've all got cell phones, but they said there'd be more long distance phone calls made today than any other day in the entire year. So all of that, you put all that together, and what that means is mamas matter. Mamas are important. Even when uh, Jesus was speaking of uh, John the Baptist, he said, uh, of everyone who's born of a mother, John the Baptist is the greatest. Now that would be all of us, right? Because we're all born of a mother. You know, I know there's, there's uh, evolutionaries out there that think that we may have come from a uh, monkey, but it still had to be a woman monkey, right? So, <laughs> you know what they said? <laughs> uh, mama's baby, uh, daddy's baby. <laughs> But uh, Mitch Alvin, and I thought this was a great quote that said behind every one of your stories is also your mother's story because where your story began, or your story began with her. Every one of our stories began with our mother. So we rejoice with you and we celebrate with you and we appreciate you. But I want you to know that I'm very careful when I say that. Yes, we need to rejoice and thank our mothers. But uh, there's a couple reasons I think we need to be careful. Uh, first of all, uh, I know that Mother's Day is not always a happy day for everybody. I, I know that. Uh, some of you may have lost your mothers this year or recently, and for, you know, I've not lost my mother, but I lost my dad, and that was 14 years ago, and it's still as fresh today as it is 14 years ago. And maybe some of you don't have a great relationship with your mother. Maybe it was never a great relationship. Maybe you don't have great relationships with your children. Maybe you don't have great relationships with you. You know, maybe some of you have lost a child. And I know that must be horrible. Uh, 
some of you, maybe you had to make tough decisions when you were younger, and uh, you carry some of that around with you today. So I, I know that Mother's Day for some of us can be a very, very tough day of year. So if that's you, if that's one of you women in here today, I want you to know that we grieve with you, that we commend you, that we walk with you, and that it is my prayer that God will give you the grace and God will give you the strength to get through this very difficult time. So I, I want to make sure that uh, when we say that we honor a mother, we also know that we honor all women. Uh, the opening video we saw this morning said, motherhood is not for the faint of heart. And we have some real warriors in here. And because I know many of you, I know that to be the fact. So the Odyssey Church wants to honor all mothers, even those who are not. So we honor all you women. We appreciate you and we love you. And I'd like to give you a big round of applause. So now I said, you know, I said there's another reason too. Uh, we do love our mothers, uh, but the fact is, uh, they're gifts from God, and we should love them and appreciate them every day, not just one day a year, you know, Fifth Commandment and all that kind of stuff. But we also need to keep our eyes on Jesus, and, we, and we're guilty of that, and I think we're going to be guilty of that in a couple of, of minutes. We should, we should never forget that our eyes should be focused on Jesus. You know, we sometimes in churches, sometimes in very good mean times, we put the focus on something or someone that it shouldn't be, and we take our focus off of Jesus. I don't think there's a mother in heaven today that wants to focus on them. If they're in heaven today, their focus is solely on the Lamb of God. And that's where our focus should be as well. Jesus should always be the focus of our attention. So with that being said, we're going to wrap up our series that we've been in for the last five weeks, this series that's called Not a Fan. And if you're new to us, this might be like walking in on the last 15 minutes of a movie so if you'd like and you hear like what you hear today, uh, you can go to theodysseychurch.com and you can uh, pull up all the previous messages in a series. I think all five of them are already up online. Uh, in fact, every message that we've ever given here or has been given here should be online. And as long as you have a computer and internet there, you know, without that, you're still going to be in trouble. But if you haven't been here for a while, you know, at the beginning when you're watching a TV show, they sort of give you the review. Uh, the big question we've been asking through this is, are you a fan of Jesus or are you a follower of Jesus? I mean, what does it really mean to follow Jesus? And the reason we've been asking that is so we can examine our own hearts. It's not so you can examine your neighbor's heart and point out all their flaws and say, well, I don't know if that person is really following Jesus. The idea is that we examine our own hearts. Does our life look like what Jesus says it should look like if we consider ourselves to be a follower of Christ? Does our life look like what it should look like if we consider ourselves to be a Christian, or maybe more than a Christian, someone who truly follows him? The dictionary defines a fan as an enthusiastic admirer, and we all see fans in the sport world. Though it's harder to see in some areas, but you go to NASCAR, and you see a bunch of fans in a stadium. But who are the real people down on the field? They're the ones that's doing all the hard work. They're the ones that are doing the things that make the whole race take place. So the question has been, are you a fan of Jesus or are you a follower of Jesus? Because as a follower, I guess the best way to define if you're a follower of Jesus is what is defined in Scripture about 300 times, and that is, are you a disciple of Jesus? And a disciple is a person who sits at the feet of their master, not just to learn, because it's easy to know, it's hard to do. You sit at the feet of your master so that you can learn to think like him, so you can learn to talk like him, so you can learn to behave like him. Now we know we're following Jesus, and he's perfect, and we're not perfect. So what this means is we do the best that we can in our human ability, but I believe, and many in here believe, that God not only gives us the grace for his salvation, but he gives us the power of his spirit to do what we can't do, to live as Christ lives. Doesn't mean we're perfect. Christianity is about progression, not perfection. But he gives us the ability through his power to do what we can't do in our power, and that is to live like Jesus. Now another way you may look at this overarching question is, are you someone who waves and cheers Jesus on? Are you willing to get on the field and go wherever 
whenever and do whatever Jesus calls you to do. I'm not sure that you can call yourself a follower of Jesus if you aren't willing to follow him into the places that he went or he calls you to be. And truthfully, Jesus went to some very uncomfortable places and he would go at very inconvenient times. He was called to do very difficult and very uncomfortable things. Like dying on a cross for the people that he loved. Like dying on a cross for each one of us in this room. So this morning we're going to spend most of our time in the Gospel of John chapter 6. If you have your Bibles, you're welcome to turn there now. If you don't, the verses will be on the screen up here over the stage, but there is something special about having your own Bible and taking notes in it um, and highlighting it. And yes, we allow, I think God allows us to write in our Bibles. But we're going to start out by simply saying, and we started this series out by saying, there's really only two types of people when you really come down to it. This time, a hundred years from now, the people sitting in this room, more than likely, there won't be two kinds of people and those that are saved and those that are unsaved, right? Because most of us in here will probably be in eternity a hundred years from now. So we're either going to be headed to a place of eternal comfort or we're going to be headed to a place of eternal condemnation. I believe, and I hope everyone in here believes, there is something after this life. Paul said if there's nothing after this life and Jesus isn't who he says he is, all the preaching and everything we do is all worthless. We might as well do anything that we want. So we have those who are saved and those that are unsaved. But I think we can break that down into really four groups, four types of people. You have the saved and the unsaved, and, and they, they're pretty, pretty straightforward. You're saved and you know it, and you're unsaved and you don't. I mean, you're unsaved and you know it. You know, I, I have a friend of mine who, who just, he knows what Jesus requires. And somebody I love, I talk to often. He says, I know what Jesus requires. I'm just not willing to surrender my life for what he is like. I'm not willing to die to self to live for him. And he goes, I know where it's going to lead me. He's saved, or maybe he's unsaved, and he knows it. But then we have another group of people. They're saved, and they don't know it. I had a lady that I ministered to at the last church I was at, and she had been there. Uh, she was 80 years old. She had been going to church almost her entire life. When she got married in her mid-20s, uh, a pastor came over her house and, and explained the, what we call the Roman road, the, the, the way to salvation, and her husband got on his knees and said the prayer. Now this woman, for, this woman for 60 years has been attending church, active in church. She had so much fruit in her life. She spoke about Jesus. She talked about Jesus. I think she dreamed about Jesus. She could, you could tell that she really loved Jesus. Jesus. But in her late 80s, I was able to visit her at a house. She very rarely ever come to church. And uh, she spoke honestly to me. For over 60 years, she carried a burden in her heart. She had never said a man-made ritual that we make such a big deal of in church. She had never said the prayer of salvation. And she wasn't sure she was going to be go to heaven because she hadn't said these few simple words. Now, she had so much fruit in her life. I'm not her judge, but the fruit of her life said she had been saved forever. But she didn't know it because she had never, she felt so guilty because she had got on her knees that night 60 years ago and said this simple prayer. And I was able to, you know, Lord used me to be able to say the prayer and give her comfort and enjoy his salvation. But can you imagine carrying that guilt around for 60 plus years simply because you hadn't said a prayer? So I believe she was saved. But she didn't know she was saved. But then we come to a group <coughs> that this series is really directed at. This series of messages are really the, the people that concern me the most. It's what it's designed for. It's why it was so important for me to speak this message. And, and, and I've been praying that it's been speaking to you as well. And that is those that are unsaved and don't. They're unsaved, but they think they're saved. They made Jesus their Savior, but they never made him their Lord. They say they believe in Jesus, but they live like he doesn't exist. If you were seeing him on Sunday in church, they say and do all the right things. But if you didn't look at their Facebook page on Monday, not so much. 
Now, I'm not anybody's judge. Please understand that. I think some of these people are fantastic, great fans of Jesus who admire him very much. But Jesus never wanted fans, did he? He wanted followers. He wanted disciples who would act like him and be like him and talk like him and do the things that he did. And according to Jesus, this isn't a few people. This isn't half the people. This is many, many, many people. This is a lot of people. You know, I tell you often, one of the scariest verses in all of Scripture to me is found in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 21 through 23. And it says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom of heaven, but only he who does the will of my Father. Many, many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? And in your name drive out demons and perform many miracles? Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you away from me, you evil doers. These are people that are walking and saying they're Christians, for lack of a better term. They get to heaven, he just shuts the door. They're not allowed in. And again, these aren't my words. These are the words of Jesus himself. Jesus says the qualifier, here's the qualifier of entering into the kingdom of heaven. Verse 21, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter into heaven, but only he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. And we have to be careful because salvation is not by works. And I don't want you to think that that's what I'm preaching. I'm not preaching that at all. Salvation is by faith alone, by grace alone, by Christ alone. But according to the brother of Jesus, the evidence of our faith is that we have a transformed life. That our life is different than we said we were when we said we were, we became a Christian. That there should be some evidence in our lives that we are doing the will of God the Father. And we don't do it because we fear Him. And we don't do it because we have to. We do it because we see His great love for us. We want to satisfy Him because we love Him so much. And the reason we love Him so much is because we see how much He loves us. So in this first message, the series, we, we talked about how Jesus comes to us. And He asks us to define our relationship with Him. Is this something real and permanent? Or is this just simply that something that's a passing phase, something that's temporary? Are we just cheering Jesus on? Or are we truly coming after Jesus? Are we denying ourselves and picking up our crosses? Or are we just following Him? And He's the one and the only. Or is He the one of many? Jesus asked us, He said, define your relationship with me. Are, are you a fan enthusiastically cheering me on? Or are you on the playing field, following me wherever I ask you to go, going whenever I ask you to go, doing whatever I ask you to do? And then in lesson two, Jesus says the invitation to follow him is open to every single person, everybody. Not some people, not the good people. It doesn't matter where you've been. It doesn't matter what you've done. It doesn't matter how bad things turn out for you. It doesn't matter how things turned out because it was your fault. It doesn't matter what you've done. He turns to you and he simply says, follow me. He turns to you, he turns to me, just like he turned to Matthew, who was a simple tax collector who took advantage of his own people. And not only did he take advantage of his own people, he took advantage of the religious people. It wasn't just the Jews. Everybody had to pay taxes, including the priests. He took advantage of everybody. He was a traitor to his country, a traitor to his people, a traitor to his religion. And Jesus comes up and says, follow me. And he asks you to follow him. He asks me to follow him. He comes up to the simple woman, a woman who was probably a prostitute, and says, follow me. Just like he comes up to you and comes up to me and says, follow me. The invitation is open to anyone and everyone to follow Jesus. And then lesson three, he said, now, do you know about Jesus or do you actually know Jesus? And we looked at the religious leaders of the time. The religious leaders of the time, they knew all about Jesus. They knew all about the coming Messiah. They knew the scriptures. They knew the prophecies. They could quote and memorize everything that the scriptures had said. And Jesus is standing right in front of them. And they don't recognize him. Because they don't know him. They know about him. They don't know him. I'm reading a book right now by Tim Keller. Great book. I know all about Tim Keller. I read the autobiography on the back. I read all the things that he wrote in there. But if he walked in this room, I wouldn't know. Never seen him.
or you actually know Jesus. Knowing about Jesus is good. Knowing Jesus himself is far better. And we need to study the scripture. We need to memorize the scripture. We need to bear him in our heart. That's a good thing to do. But Jesus calls us more to that. He calls us into this intimate, this personal relationship with him. Knowing about Jesus is good. Knowing Jesus is far, far better. And then, in lesson four, we started talking about what it really takes to be a disciple of Jesus. And we talked about the fact that pastors, people much like myself, myself included, have sometimes watered down the gospel in fear of driving people away from the church or in fear of not getting people into the church. We preach these easy messages sometimes, and yes, we do need to hear about the grace of Jesus, and yes, we do need to hear about the mercy of Jesus, and yes, we need to hear about the love of Jesus. Those are the things that Jesus preached when he was on earth, and we need to hear about them often. That was what made him so terrific. That's what made him so different than this religious people at the time. He was talking about grace, and he was talking about love of God, and not the wrath of God all the time. We need to hear those messages, and we need to hear them often. But you know what? We also need to hear the heart of don't we? we need to hear the full counsel of the gospel. We need the good with sometimes the bad. You cannot understand the wrath of God unless you understand the love of God. And you can't understand the love of God unless you understand the wrath of God. The two go hand in hand. The teachings that Jesus taught, and again, these aren't my words. These are the words of Jesus found in, in the gospel of Luke chapter 14. Verse 26 says, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and his mother and his wife and his children and his brothers and, yes, even his sisters and even his own life, he cannot be my disciples. Now, Jesus is, is using what we call hyperbole. He, he's not saying you have to hate your mom. What he's saying, you're in, in, comparison, in comparison to your love for me, your love for others should look like hate. He's not saying you hate them. There's no way I could ever hate my mom. Mom's the greatest thing in the world. But he's saying if you have to choose between one or the other, I need you to choose me. And that's tough. You have to put Jesus above all other relationships. Verse 27, the same chapter says, anyone who does carry his cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. A couple of verses later, in chapter 30, uh, verse 14, chapter, uh, verse 33, he says, any of you who does not give up everything cannot be my disciple. Jesus is saying, unless you're willing to do these things, not only are you really not my disciple, are you not only not follow me, you can't follow me. Those are tough teachings. Now the good news is, week five, Jesus comes to us and he starts to balance this a little bit. Because see, he could do the things that I can't do. He could balance grace and love perfectly. I have a tendency to either speak too much on grace or too much on wrath, and Jesus could speak both perfectly. He comes with this, this message of love, and this is great news. This is good news. Jesus tells our relationship with him, it's more than, it's more than rules. It's more than the law. It's more than these rituals. That's what's made it so hard. It, 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 the people of the time, much like the people of today, had made it all about the rules. And if you didn't follow certain rules, then, hey, you just had no chance of getting into heaven. We do the same thing to people sometimes, don't we? Jesus, it's not about the rules. It's about our relationship. It's all about love. We don't put him first and follow him. We don't make Jesus Lord over our lives because we have to. We don't deny ourselves because we have to. We don't pick up our crosses because we have to. We aren't willing to give up everything because we have to. We're not willing to do any of those things because we have to or out of fear. We're doing it because we love him. We see how much he loves us, and we love him enough to start living for him. It's not about, here's the great news, it's not about earning God's love. It's not about earning God's favor. It's about coming to the realization that you already had God's favor. You already had God's love. Jesus doesn't want us to follow a bunch of rules. He wants us to follow him. Jesus wants us to go to a bunch of religious rituals. He wants a relationship with us as personal and intimate. He wants us to be deeply committed, deeply devoted followers. Scripture says, we remain in him, he remains in us. So that brings us today. Today is the final lessons in this series. Today is simply decision time. Today we're asking the question, is Jesus 
enough. There's a scene in the Gospel of John, chapter 6, and in this scene, Jesus is at the very height of his ministry. People are following him. Probably at this time, thousands of people are following him wherever he goes. In fact, we know thousands and ten thousands of people were following him, but the Scripture tells us so. They're traveling with Jesus. They're, they're following him in droves. He's been driving out demons. He, I mean, you, you, this would be like a, a, a great movie scene. You know? He's driving out demons and he's challenging the religious authority. There's everything a great movie would have. He's healing the blind. He's healing the lame. He's healing the sick. He, he, he's teaching about the love of God. He's teaching about the kingdom of God. And he's been prophesizing. He's been doing all these things that nobody has ever done before and nobody has ever done since. And of course, it's attracting people to him. People were just gravitating. They're flocking to him. Great crowds had gathered to cheer Jesus on and see what he was going to do next. And really, we sometimes read this and, and we forget. What if somebody came in the world today just like that? What, what if the newscast came in and you saw people and, and, and they had withered hands and all of a sudden they were able to... To, to have their hands straightened out there, wait on TV. And, and somebody you knew that had broken their back in an accident and hadn't been able to walk for 20 years, Jesus says, get up and walk and follow me. And they do it. Wouldn't you at least be curious? Wouldn't you at least want to go see what was going to happen next? I mean, he was doing things that no one had ever done. The crowds were big. And on this particular day, the scripture tells us there were 5,000 men there. Now, at that time, they only counted the men. It says there were 5,000 men plus the women and children. So by, by conservative estimates, there was at least 15,000 people. Some say that there was probably 25,000 people there. I've heard estimates that there may have been over 40,000 people there. But either way, there was a lot of people there. And this is recorded not by somebody who heard it through somebody else and heard it through somebody else and it was gossip. This was recorded by a man named John. And John was one of Jesus' closest friends and he was actually an eyewitness to this event. Everybody's there this day to see what Jesus is going to do next, to hear what he's got to say. And in John chapter 5, or John chapter 6, verse 5 through 7, it says this. It says, when Jesus looked up, and saw the great crowds coming toward him. He said to Philip, Where shall we buy bread for these people to eat? He asked us only to test it. For he had already had in mind what he was going to do. Philip answered, It would take more than a year and a half worth of wages, or more than a half a year's wages, to buy enough food for each one to have even a single one. Now, you know, this is not the point of the message, but I have to put this in here. If Jesus would test the people that were closest to him on that day, the people that were his greatest friends as he walked and had been with him for all this period of time, do you think for a moment that he wouldn't test you as well? We all go through tests, don't we? And Philip that day, I don't think Philip passed the test. I mean, here it is, in a whole day of teaching, it's starting to get late in the afternoon, everybody's starting to get hungry, and so Jesus turns to his disciples, particularly to Philip, and he says, what are you going to do to feed all these people? Now think about it, 25,000, 15,000, 40,000, doesn't matter, either way, there's a lot of hungry mouths to feed, isn't there? From Philip's perspective, first of all, this wasn't his problem. But even if it was his problem, there ain't nothing he can do about it. But there was another disciple there that day, a man by the name of Andrew. And Andrew's response had absolutely nothing to do with money. It had everything to do with faith. Another one of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, spoke up. Here is a boy with five small barley loaves. He's got a little bit of bread. Two small fish, not even big fish, just two small fish. But Jesus, how far would they go among so many? See, Philip just said, hey, no, there's nothing we can do. But here's Andrew. He's looking through the crowd. He's saying, who's got what? He sees a boy over there. He's got his bag lunch with him. He's got a little bit of bread and a couple small fish. Now, Philip may have failed the test, but I, I think Andrew passed it with flying colors. 
can, can, I, you know, sometimes I try to picture things. Can you imagine Andrew as he comes to Jesus making this announcement? Maybe he had a smile on his face. Maybe he had this sense of expectation. Hmm, I wonder what Jesus is going to do with this. I wonder what Jesus is going to do next. I mean, you ever have faith like, like Andrew had that day? You know, Lord, this is all I got. And you know and I know. It's just simply not enough. I don't know what you're going to do with so little, but I'm going to bring it to you. And by faith, I know and I'm going to see that you're going to take care of this problem with just the little bit that I brought to you. Have you ever had that kind of faith? And Jesus didn't disappoint. He took that little boy's sack lunch and he fed the entire crowd. The Bible says even after everybody had their fill, if they were like me, uh, That's a lot of food. Uh, After everyone had their fill, there was still plenty of food left over. Verses 10 through 13. Jesus said, have the people sit down. There was plenty of grass in that place. And they sat down. About 5,000 men were there. Jesus then took the loaves. Notice he gives thanks. And distributed to those who were seated as much as they wanted. And he did the same thing with the fish. When they all had enough to eat, he said to his disciples, gather the pieces that are left over. But there was nothing wasted. So they gathered them and filled 12 baskets with the pieces of the five barley loaves left over. Those who had them. See, when we come to Jesus, it doesn't matter how much we have. We don't have to have faith in what we have. We give Jesus all we have, no matter how little or how big, and he takes it and he provides for us and he doesn't allow anything to go to waste and then he gives back to us more than we had to start with. He takes what little bit we have. If we'll just trust Him with it, if we'll just give it to Him, Jesus will take what little bit we have and turn it into more than we need. So everybody's full. What do you do when you get full? It's hot during the dinner. You've got to take a nap and go to sleep, right? So after dinner, the crowd decides to camp out for the night. They're not going to walk all the way home. They want to be with Jesus the next day. And you know what they're thinking. Supper is good. You know Jesus is going to do the same thing in the morning. I wonder what we're going to have for breakfast. <laughs> so the next morning they wake up and Jesus is gone. His disciples are gone. And they start looking around where he's. And finally they realize that he's gone to the other side of the lake. So they, they get in there. They start walking. Jesus went by the boat. It's only about seven and a half miles across the lake. They walk around the edges. They finally get to the other side. They're starving now. They've done best breakfast. It's lunchtime. See, the crowds seem like they have no higher priority than wanting to be with Jesus. They are these committed fans, and, and maybe, maybe they're more than fans. Maybe they really are following Jesus for the right reason. Maybe they are deeply committed followers. But by the time they catch up with Jesus, they are hungry. They're starving. They missed their chance to order breakfast. They're ready to find out what's on the lunch menu. But Jesus does the unexpected. He closes down the all-you-can-eat buffet. Uh, he's not handing out any more samples. And that's where we pick it up in verse 25. When they found him on the other side, they, they asked him, Rabbi, when did you get here? And Jesus answered, I tell you the truth. You're looking for me, not because you saw the miracles, because you ate the loaves, and you had to fill. Jesus says, it, it, you know, it's time for us to talk. It's time for us to have that DTR talk. It's time for us to define our relationship. See, it's time for the crowd to define their relationship with Jesus Christ. Jesus knows these people aren't going to all the trouble and all the sacrifice because they're following him. They're just following the food. So the first question I want to ask you this morning, actually I want to show you first, is... Look how the crowd responds when the drive through window gets closed and all food's taken away. Jesus says, do not work for food that spoils, but food that endures for eternal life. Food which the Son of Man will give, for, give you, for on him God the Father has placed his seal of approval. And then they ask him, what must we do to do the work God requires? And here's the answer. So simple. Jesus answered, the work of God is this, to believe in the one he has sent. And then in verse 35 through 40, Jesus offers himself, but the question becomes, is Jesus enough for the people in the crowd that day? 
is it enough for the people who were there that day, for the people who were actually calling themselves his followers? When Jesus is literally the only thing left on the menu, is he enough for you? Jesus declared, I am the brother. He who comes to me will never go hungry, and he who believes in me will never be thirsty. But as I have told you, you have seen me, and yet you still do not believe. All those that the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me, I will never drive away. For I come to, I come down from heaven not to do my will, but to do the will of Him who sent me. And this is the will of Him who sent me, that I shall not lose none, all of that that He has given me, but raise them up on the last day. For my Father's will is that everyone who looks to the Son and believes in Him shall have eternal life, and I will raise him up on that day. See, the first point I want to make this morning is this. This is what I want you to think about. When Jesus is the only thing on the menu, you're going to find out whether he's the one that you're really hungry for. When there are no other options than Jesus, you find out if Jesus is enough. If you've been stranded in the desert and you're dying of thirst, if you're dying of dehydration, and all you can think about is getting just some water on your parched tongue, and you know you're going to die if you don't get water, and you come behind, you come upon a stack of gold in a pond, which one are you going to choose? You don't care about the gold. All you care about is the water. And if you haven't figured this out yet, I'm praying that you figure it out soon. Thirsting spiritually is far, far worse than thirsting physically. We try and fill our sides. We try to quench our thirst with the possessions of the world, the, the people around us, with these empty promises, with the pleasures of this world. But only Jesus can provide what satisfies the soul. He said, I am the bread of life. And he who comes to me will never go hungry. And he who believes in me will never be thirsty. If it was Jesus or gold, if it was Jesus or your relationship, if it was Jesus or your job, if it was Jesus or anything else, would you choose Jesus? Is Jesus enough? This folks, this ain't a game. It's about living and receiving abundant life right here in this world. And receiving eternal life with your Creator in the next world. Is Jesus enough? Is Jesus enough when He asks you to go, to follow Him, wherever and whenever and whatever He asks you to do? And He tells us, we have to make the choice. As much as I love my mother, she can't make the choice for me. I have to make it myself. He says, you want the physical, but I have the spiritual. I have something that's better. But in order for you to have the physical, you've got to have the spiritual. For you to have the better, you have to believe in me and follow me and become my disciple. And he tells us, this isn't necessarily going to be easy. Because we all come to a point in our relationship with Jesus where he comes to us and he asks us, Am I enough? Is Jesus enough? He asks us to define the relationship with Him. He says it's no longer. See, He allows us to get... I, I, I've seen it so happen. He, he comes and He gives you these miracles and He does these things to you like when you first come to Christ. And what He's doing, He's watering and He's fertilizing. He's letting these roots get deep. But it's sooner or later He comes to you. And sometimes tribulation comes and He said, Am I enough now? See, I was enough when I was providing the miracles. I was enough when everything was going good. But now that I've taken some things off the menu, am I enough now? But the good news is Jesus doesn't ask us any, to do anything that he wasn't willing to do, our, do himself. On the night Jesus was arrested, the Gospel uh, of Matthew, chapter 26, says, he, he, he just looks at him. He says, do you think, do you think I can't call on my father? Do you think? That if I call him a fire, he won't at once put at my disposal more than 12,000 legions or 12 legions of angels, which was thousands of angels. But then he asks us, but how then would the scriptures be fulfilled? The ones that say it has to be done this way. He's telling
telling those people right there, I got a choice. I can call my father, he'll send down the angels, and he'll say, I don't have to go to this cross. But in the book of Hebrews, the author tells us, the author records, let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of God, his father. Jesus chose the cross. Jesus endured the cross. And the Bible says he did it with joy. How could he do that with joy? Because he loves us. How can you pick up your cross and deny yourself every day? Because you love him. What will you choose? See, the fans that day, they've seen Jesus perform the miracles. And some of you in here today have seen Jesus perform miracles in your very own lives. But like them, some of us still what we want, don't we? We still want what we want. When Jesus gives us our tour, our natural desire is to be fans and not followers because following is going to require sacrifice, and we don't like sacrifice. We don't like to deny ourselves. It was the same thing with this crowd. One commentator said this must have been the saddest day of Jesus' earthly ministry. Verse 66 in the same chapter says, From this time many of his disciples turned back and no longer followed him. When Jesus said... <coughs> has to be about who I am, not what I do. It has to be about what I am, not what I give you. Most of them left. Like the crowd, they just followed. They didn't follow for the, the, the they didn't follow for the for who he was. They followed for the friendship. They followed for the food. Not for the bond they could have had with Jesus himself, who was the Son of God, God himself, but for the benefits that he could give them. And they weren't following Jesus because they loved Jesus. They were following Jesus because what they could do, what Jesus could do for them. Jesus gives them this choice, and like most people today, they walk away. See, what we believe is revealed in what in how we act. What we think is how we behave. What we believe is how we act. And we say we believe. But do we act like we believe? See, here in John chapter 6, the crowd has, decide, has to decide if Jesus is enough. Or are they just hanging around with Jesus for the perks? Or is it really about the relationship they can have with him? And you remember what happened. Most of them turn and go away. Most of them go home. And in the long run, that's what happens to most people today. In Matthew chapter 7, verse 13 and 14, Jesus says this, and I'm reading from the New Living Translation. You can enter God's kingdom only through the narrow gate. The highway to hell is broad, and the gate is wide for the many who choose that way. But the gateway to life is very narrow, and the road is difficult, and only a few will find it. You know, you see that thing on Facebook? Somebody wrote, uh, we sing the highway to hell and the stairway to heaven. So you know which way most people choose. Scripture tells us that wide is the road that leads to destruction and hell, and in the end, whether we like it or not, most of the people we know just won't accept Christ invitation to follow him. Oh, they like the idea of heaven. They like the miracles. They like the bread. They like the free show. They like the chance to be around a lot of people. They like the excitement. But when Jesus wipes all of that off the table, when Jesus says, I'm the only thing you can have, they simply don't know this. John 6, 67, Jesus turns to his disciples, to the ones that are they're still there, says he turned to the twelve. Do you want to leave too? And, and I think about that. I don't know how Jesus asked that question. I mean, did he ask it in anger because he saw so many people walk away already? Did he ask it in disappointment? I don't I don't know what tone was in his voice. Did he was he sad when it became clear so many people walked away? I mean, he was God. This must have broken his heart. How many people do you know that started to go to church and then they just left? They say things like, you know, I'm not getting anything out of it. They get anything out of it, they probably won't put anything in it. Well, church is boring. It can be very boring if you don't know the scriptures yourself. Sunday's the only day I get to sleep in. I don't want to sacrifice that. They don't do the things I like to do. So I quit going. And see what they're really saying is it comes down to this. They were going to church for what the church could do for them, but they didn't have a relationship with Jesus, so they simply left. 
It was about them, and it was never about God. See, last year we last week we heard this story about a pastor. He spoke at a large church, and and he said with tears in his eyes, a man came up after the service, big man with big belt buckle, but he's crying. He's telling the story of his prodigal daughter. She's living a lifestyle which has caused her to walk away from the church, away from her faith, away from Jesus. And could have been me. Man wasn't looking for an answer. He wasn't making excuses. He simply said. He simply summed up everything in one statement. He said, we raised her in church, but we did not raise her in Christ. See, when the, when the costs begin to outweigh the benefits, people stop coming. It's too early. Can't get there. You know, my kids, my kids, they, they, play, they play baseball on Sunday. You know, I don't want to deny them that. You know, the ball game on today. I can't miss that. We love camping on the weekends. We live near the beach. I like going to the beach on Sundays. I have to work on Sundays. See, when the costs begin to outweigh the benefits, a lot of fans, they just quit following. Think about it this way. Uh, you start dating somebody. Now, if you're married, go back to your single years. You start dating somebody. And first night, you take them out to the movies. Buy some popcorn, buy a few snacks, pick up the tab, and you really enjoyed yourself. So the next time you said, you know, I'm going to step it up a bit. Take them out to a nice restaurant. Whatever's on the menu, you get it. This is on me. I really enjoyed our last day. They eat, they get their food, things are going well, you step it up a bit, you're taking them out, you're entertaining. And one day you call them and say, listen, you know, I have to tell you, I, I really like the way things are going. I got a very special day set up for us. And you go to their house and you pick them up and you take them to the beach. You're walking hand in hand and suddenly you stop and you just start pouring your heart out to them. Tell them how much you, you really love them and that, that, that they're the person that you've been looking for. And just, just, just give them everything you got. And after you're done, they look at you and say, is, is this the date? When are we going somewhere? And you begin to realize they were never there for you. Now, they were only there for the free food and the entertainment and the nights out, for what they could get out of it. Do you think Jesus might feel that way at times? Do you think that's how he felt that day? So often, so often, we love what Jesus can do for us. But we have a hard time just accepting him for who he is. God himself. I mean, wouldn't it break your heart if that was you that had gone out on that day? Maybe that's how Jesus feels today. He asks the disciples, the people that he's grown closest to, whether they're going to leave him. Would his most devoted disciples turn out to be fans too? Would they be not willing to stick around when the teachings and things got tough? Were they going to be more focused on their crowds and their popularity than being attracted to Jesus himself and, and this great message of life? Were they going to abandon Jesus too? Some of them stayed. They made the decision to follow. They made the decision to go deeper with Jesus. Verse 68 and 69 says, Simon Peter answered and said, Lord, to whom would we go? You have the words to eternal life. We believe and we know that you are the Holy One of God. Now I said the first point is that when Jesus is the only thing on the menu, you find out whether Jesus is really the one that you're hungry for. This is the second point. When you really know Jesus as Lord, when you really believe and know Jesus is Lord, you don't want anything else. Peter's answer sort of sums it all. To whom worse we go? And with that one question, it's almost as if he asked a thousand questions, isn't it? Who could lead us like you, Jesus? Who could teach us with wisdom like yours, Jesus? Who could possibly draw us closer to God than you, Jesus? Why will we ever want to leave the Messiah, the anointed, the Holy One of God? Who else is worthy of being followed other than you? Who else is compared to you? How could we ever find anybody like you? 
See, the fans left when the, the teachings got difficult. He asked them to sacrifice. When he asked them to take up their cross, when he asked them to die, the fans just took off. And I don't think, I don't think it was just because they preferred a more comfortable life. I think they still questioned, was Jesus actually who he said he was? I think they still had questions. Because if they knew, if they believed and they knew, their actions would show that they loved him. If they, I mean, think about it, if they were guaranteed a ticket into heaven, if God came down and said, here's your ticket into heaven, this is what you got to do. If you no know, question about it, we follow. If you had the full assurance, if they had the full assurance, that Jesus was the Son of God, if they truly believed and were completely convinced, 100%, following Jesus would lead to abundance on this earth, if they really believed that following Jesus would lead to an eternity of heavenly bliss and worship and joy in the presence of joy and, and of the Lord in the next life, wouldn't they follow Him whenever, wherever, and do whatever He asked them to do? Peter said, we believe and we know that you are the only one that you are the Holy One, that you are the Messiah, the Anointed One of God. I mean, who, who, who wouldn't do the things Jesus required if we truly believed in our heart and knew with every answer of our being? We'd have a whole lot easier time believing the tougher portions of Scripture. If we all knew and believed the way the disciples did, I, I think we'd all be followers of Jesus and none of us would be fans. So here's the third point I want to make the problem. Here's the problem. We don't know the way we wish we knew, so we don't believe the way we should believe. When Jesus is the only thing on the menu, you find out if he's the only one that you're hungry for. When you really know Jesus is Lord, you don't want to leave him. You don't want anything else. And let me repeat this third point. We just simply know the way we wish we knew. We just don't know the way we wish we knew. So we don't believe the way we should believe. See, the first half of this statement is really tough to face. See, we really wish God would lay it all out for us, don't we? We wish God would just come up and wave in the sky. We wish He'd give us a vision. We wish He'd come and speak to us audibly. We wish He'd send an angel or some kind of unmistakable sign. Something that just tells us that he's alive and in charge and Jesus is his son. But that's not the way God does things, is it? The Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7, it is by faith, not by sight. That's the way it is for us. It was the way it was with the disciples as well. They were able to witness the miracles, but eventually they had to choose to know and believe Jesus was the Messiah. Choosing to know. Choosing to believe. See, it's a choice. We think that we're going to have this great epiphany one day. But the choice is ours, isn't it? How we think is how we act. We choose to believe and we choose to know and the evidence is all there. If we know and believe Jesus is the Messiah, choosing to know and believe is a choice. We have to make that choice just like the disciples had to make. Because if we would believe with the same fire the same passion the disciples had, I think our eyes would look different. Because in the end, it comes down to whether Jesus is enough for us. It comes down to whether or not we're going to choose to move from being just a fan to being a follower of Jesus. I've got about five more minutes. We're going to watch this short video and we'll begin to wrap everything up. Hebrews 9.27 says, Man is destined to die once, and after that to face the judgment. Those are the two guarantees. We will all die, and we will all stand before God. When that moment comes to all of us, there's only one question that will really matter, is have you decided to follow Jesus? <clears throat> If I could, I would ask you that question differently. Because it's very personal. I wish I could come over to your house and knock on your door. Hopefully I could talk you into letting me come in and sit down for a few minutes. 
and I want to sit across the kitchen table from you and look you in the eye and ask you this question. I know that when you hear me ask, have you decided to follow Jesus, many of you quickly nod your head yes and say, yeah, I'm a follower. But why do you say that? Because I'm not asking if your parents were followers. I'm not asking if you've prayed a prayer. I'm not asking if you say grace before meals or if you come to church. I'm not even asking if you believe in Jesus. I am asking, are you a follower of Jesus? Because one day, there are many who say, I am a follower that will stand before God and be declared fans. Hebrews 9, 27 says, a man is destined to die once, and after that, face the judgment. See, there's two guarantees, two guarantees in that single verse. One is that we will all die, and one is that we will face the judgment. Now, the first one, every one of us believe and know, don't we? I'm like W.C. Field when he was reading his Bible at the, at the end of his friend walked in and said, what are you doing reading the Bible? You're an atheist. You never read about Jesus. What are you doing? I'm the same. I'm the same way. I've been looking for loopholes, but I've done the research. Mortality rate worldwide, 100%. We all know one day we have to face death, don't we? It's that second part we're just not sure about. Will we truly face judgment? And there are many people out there that don't believe that they have to stand before God one day. But just because some people don't believe it doesn't make it not true. What I've never understood, I, I truly, even when I was living for myself, I knew one day I had to face the judgment. It took me changing the way I thought and choosing to follow Jesus to stop the thing. But I always knew, I always knew, I wasn't willing to risk it not being true. Eternity is way too long to be wrong. So the first point this morning is, why, when Jesus is the only thing you have left, you will find out whether he's the only one or the one of many. You will find out if he's truly the one that you're hungry for. The second point is, when you really know Jesus is Lord, you won't want to leave him. When you really realize how much he loved you and what he had to get through to offer you this salvation that he offers you that's free to you but wasn't free to him, you won't want to leave him. The problem is we don't always believe and know the way we should, the way we wish we would, so we don't believe the way we should believe. And this is the final point. We don't know the day, but we know his name. It's true. One day Christ will return. Whether you go to him or whether he comes back to us, we don't know the day, but we do know his name. We don't know the day when we're going to start having health problems and our health might fail. We don't know that our, the day that our finances might go in the wrong direction. We don't know the day we might die, and we probably never will. Even though we don't know the day, we know his name. And on that day, I don't think there's anybody in here who wants to be declared just a fan of Jesus. And I know we aren't offered the guarantee that we always want, but Jesus does offer us guarantees. Jesus guarantees that if you put your trust in him, if you choose to believe and you choose to know, he will never fail you. He guarantees you, if you stake your life on his message of truth, he will stake his life on your eternity in heaven. Jesus guarantees you, if you put your trust and your hope in him, he'll guide you to an eternity with God the Father. And we don't know the day, but we know his name. And the scriptures tell us, by his name, Jesus Christ, his name alone, we are saved. But you have to decide. Are you a fan or a follower of Jesus? Because all those guarantees are for followers who refuse to leave his side. All those promises are for followers who ask, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. We know and we believe you are truly the anointed one of God. The anointed one means the Messiah. What we translate the Christ. 
the question I want to leave you with as we close this series is this. Are you willing to follow him for who he is and not what he can do for you? Is Jesus enough?